the surface. Find your purpose. Remove the veils. Peek behind the curtains and see what's really twerking. Televised lies and frequencies of confusion. We can't win for losing. I grip on reality. Infatuated with temporal things we see that pass away with the user. Eventually, look beneath the surface. When will you part back the curtains of your darkened minds to seek truth and righteousness? Cause we're running out of time. Bloods, earthquakes, fires, droughts, and wars. AIDS, Ebola, was now hepatitis and SARS. Why no man take these things to heart? Cause the kings of the earth are mad and know not peace. The truth falls in the streets because no one seeks it beyond the surface. If you dare to be so bold, read about the God of Israel and the people he chose. All that glitters ain't gold. Look deep beneath the surface. Follow the light, it's worth it. It leads to something. Yahweh of hosts is his name. The source of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Yah. Good afternoon. My name is Isak Ben Israel, and on behalf of the Cultural Center of NCCI, the Advanced Information Team, I would like to thank you for tuning in to Beyond the Surface. Tonight's topic of discussion, the many aspects of the Christmas story. The Bible says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, tonight, prepare to be educated. Our first topic of discussion, the nativity. This is Dawid Yisrael speaking on the nativity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So goes the adage, but putting away childish things seems to go directly against the message of Christmas. Most people are more familiar with the story of the Messiah's birth from television cartoons than from the actual accounts of the Bible. The Little Drummer Boy is a cute tale about a poor boy's attempt to get to the birth site of Yahshua. With the help of his four-legged friends, he bears the elements in the desert and reaches the manger in time to play a tune for all to nod their heads to. The visual is priceless. The accuracy is worthless. It's time to put away childish things. The story of the birth of Yahshua is dramatic enough when told accurately. The Hebrews had long anticipated the coming of a deliverer because there were Hebrew prophets that spoke to the Hebrew people about their Hebrew destiny. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 through 7 For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty Elohim, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of Dawid and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment 
and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. Because the Hebrews were aware of this prophecy and had faith that it would occur, they only lacked an understanding of when it would happen. So when Mary was told by the angel that she would give birth to one that was called Yah's salvation, even she questioned whether her family could play a role in the most important event in modern history. Luke chapter 1 verse 26 through 33 And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from Elohim unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Yosef of the house of Dawid and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Adonai is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation it should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with Elohim. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yahshua. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Adonai Elohim shall give unto him the throne of his father Dawid. And he shall reign over the house of Yaakov forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Knowing this, Yosef prepared his family as best he could, because the Italians, or the Romans, controlled Jerusalem at that time, the IRS of that time required that all Hebrew citizens travel to pay their yearly tax. Yosef took his family on the walking journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, despite the fact that Mary was close to her due date. While on that journey, they were unable to find lodging due to this Hebrew tax convention. So the actual birth took place and the child was laid in a manger, which is an animal feeding trough used like a baby bassinet. The news escaped those around them, but there were some Hebrews that were made aware of the birth and sought to verify it occurred. These wise Hebrew kings, it never said there were three, came from other cities. Being natural born Hebrews, they could not be black, white, and yellow men. So they spoke to Herod, the governor of Jerusalem at the time, to prove that they came in peace by explaining what they were doing to the officer, that is, overseer, Herod. Now when Herod heard that the long-awaited birth had actually occurred, he knew it would ultimately end his rulership, so he sought to have the child killed. His plan was as bold as it was ruthless. Black Hebrew children under two years of age were slaughtered throughout Hebrew cities. Yosef fled this tyranny, taking his family into Egypt among the other blacks outside of the control of Herod. They moved on soon after the birth and returned to Jerusalem to purify the child. Matthew chapter 2 verse 14 to 16 When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And they were there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Adonai by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Read the accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to see what took place for yourself. It's time to put away childish things. Well, it's that time of year again when everything seems to become the colors red, white, and green. For Satan has most of mankind believing that Christ was born on December 25th. But the Bible proves that December 25th could not and was not the birth of Yahshua, King of the Jews. More so, he wasn't even born in the winter. If the angel Gabriel went to Mary in the sixth month of the year, 
how could he be born in the 12th month? For pregnancies did take nine months back then also. Furthermore, if you use the calendar system that was used in, in those times, September would have been the sixth month, placing the birth of Yahshua, the true Messiah that the Bible speaks of, in the springtime, the time of year when shepherds could tend to their flock at night, and someone could give birth to a child in a barn and wrap him in swaddling cloth. So the next time December 25th comes alone, call it Christmas, call it Saturnalia, call it the day of the winter solstice, but please don't call it the birthday of Christ. Old Saint Nick, or better known as Santa Claus, how did you become a god? He knows how children behave throughout the year. He also defies the laws of nature by flying and by coming down the, the narrowest and hottest of chimneys. Prior to Christmas, Santa also appears at hundreds of street corners and shopping centers throughout the country at the same time. So these are the attributes of a god. Now let's see how old St. Nicholas became a god. St. Nicholas of Smyrna, Izmir, which is present-day Turkey, was a Greek Orthodox bishop who lived in the 4th century AD. He was very rich generous and loving to our children. Over time and in various areas such as the Protestant areas of Central and Northern Germany, St. Nicholas became known as Der Weihnachtsmann. In England he was called Father Christmas, in France he was Père Noël. He left small gifts in the children's shoes and when he came to America by way of the Dutch immigrants he was later called Santa Claus. Santa Claus's ancestry dates back to the pre-Christian days when sky-riding gods ruled the earth. You had the mythological god Odin who rode upon a flying horse and decided who perished or flourished within the winter season, as well as Thor, the Norse god who also rode upon a chariot pulled by two goats, and Saturn, which gives us the basis for many of Santa's distinctive characteristics. So the question that one should now ask after this is, is Santa a god? Saturnalia Narration by Lael Yisrael Saturnalia was the most important Roman festival which contained a number of public rites and traditions. Saturnalia was an agricultural festival held in honor of the Roman god Saturn of seeds, sowing, and plenty. Thus, his name is derived from the Latin word satis, which means to sow. There were several ancient Roman pagan festivals in December, which accounts for our present-day holiday customs. Thanksgiving, which was held in December in the past, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, and even Mardi Gras. Since the ancient pagans believed that the sun was dying on the shortest day of the year, called the winter solstice or Brumalia, a sacrificial appeal was made to the god Saturn to bless them with the rebirth of the sun god, which would return the sun. The heathens are dismayed at the signs of heaven and seek the vanities of the Christmas tree. Learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 3. Saturn eventually became associated to the Greek god Cronus. In mythology, Cronus was one of the twelve titans who swallowed the first five of his children, but Rhea supposedly saved the baby Zeus, who is the Roman god Jupiter. Zeus later dethroned Saturn and imprisoned him in the underworld with the other titan gods. Saturnalia determined the date of December 25th, as well as the nature of the celebrations until Victorian times. Several festivals were held before the Saturnalia, like Consuelia, which was the end of the sowing season festival held on December 15th, in honor of Ceres, or Ops. It is from Ceres that we get the word cereal. There was Dice Juvenalis, 
Day of the Juvenile, the coming of age for young men held in mid-December as well. In fact, dating back to the days of Babylon, the Feast of Bromelia is celebrated on December 25th by most cultures in and around the Mediterranean. Ancient sources such as the Epic of Gilgamesh and other unearthed archaeological records from Mesopotamia and Egypt verifies that Nimrod married his mother, Semiramis. She propagated the dogma that he returned as a full-grown evergreen tree that sprang from a dead tree stump overnight and left presents under the tree. To whom then will you liken Elohim? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melts a graven image, and the goldsmith spreads it over with gold, and casts silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeks unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 18 through 20. She claimed Nimrod was reincarnated through the newborn infant deifying him and herself in the process. This was also the origin of the worship of the Queen of Heaven and her sacrificial cakes spoken of in Scripture. Replacing the mythological god Saturn, their sacrifices of cookies and milk are offered up to Santa today. Let's not forget, Santa knows when you're sleeping and he knows when you're not, or if you're good or bad, so he must be a god. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger? said Yahweh. Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 18 through 19. Most cultures in the Mediterranean had religious festivals around the winter solstice. For millennia, the ancient Egyptians celebrated the birth and rebirth of the sun at this time. It was called the Feast of Sol Invictus, the Day of the Unconquered Sun. This December 25th celebration was kept particularly by Roman soldiers when the Emperor Constantine converted the empire to Christianity due to a vision that he saw in the sun, and later changed the day of worship from the Sabbath to Sunday, the first day still dedicated to the worship of the sun god Lucifer, the light bearer. Although the dates of the Roman Saturnalia celebration varied, Saturnalia was celebrated on December 17th originally. During the days of the Roman Empire, Saturnalia was extended to a week, December 17th through the 24th. But the similarities between Saturnalia and modern Christmas are too numerous to be denied. Saturnalia was focused on merrymaking, which is the reason why the words merry and jolly are used most exclusively at Christmas time. Wreaths, garlands, and evergreens were widely used in Rome. Holly was a favorite because of the colorful red berries and deep green leaves since the colors for this festival was red, green, and white. Flames were an important feature of both Christmas and Saturnalia, where candles were favorites. Yule logs, fireplace hearths, and bonfires were kindled to drive off evil spirits and rekindle the new solar year. A 1998 BBC News article entitled, You'll Never Believe It, indicated Yule was the ancient name for the traditional Celtic fire festival which marked the winter solstice and celebrated the return of the light after the longest night of the year. Even the ashes of the Yule log were thought to have magical powers. Feasts abounded with continual eating and drunkenness. Remember, wine was especially important to Romans because of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine and merriment. They served an array of rich, unclean foods like sea hedgehogs, shellfish, and of course, the pig. The Romans indulged, giving themselves up to wild folly, and thus ancient Christmas merrymaking was much more like Mardi Gras, 
which was originally celebrated on the last day of Saturnalia. Acca Laurentia, called the goddess Lupa because of her loose moral ways, was honored on this day, giving mortal men the rights to engage in amoral activities like orgies and sexual partner swapping and homosexuality. The celebrations of this ancient festival was downright licentious, and yes, these are the same festivals as our modern day year-end holidays. It's also the reason why the New England Puritans banned the celebration of Christmas by law in 1652, calling it heathenish and superstitious. As Roman culture became increasingly vulgar, so did Saturnalia, with cross-dressing, masquerades, gambling. Another established Saturnalia tradition was to cast lots among the people to choose a Saturnalicus Principus, king of the Saturnalia, or lord of misrule. He represented the god Saturn as he ruled over the festival, and his orders were to be obeyed no matter how bizarre. Each family also chose a mock king to preside over the household to assure that everyone had riotous fun. But sometimes he would take advantage of the situation to belittle his superiors. Saturnalia was a very public and highly commercial holiday where the government, schools, and businesses all closed, including the law courts and the Senate, just like today. People of all classes, the rich and poor, were considered equals, and house slaves were actually served by their masters. Young children might even head the family, which was important in patrician Rome during these backward celebrations. Gift-giving symbolized the redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor during the season of the greatest hardship to the poor. So big feasts were generally laid on by the rich to appease the gods and to feed their poor neighbors. Gifts and presents of all sorts were exchanged in Rome during Saturnalia. Dolls are little clayborne doll-like images of pastry known as sigillaria were popular gifts to boys and girls. Fruit, tapers, and candles were popular gifts to friends. The family was very important for Saturnalia. Romans would rest and relax with family and close friends, renew bonds, and reminisce about old experiences. People participated in gaming, jokes, and letting loose with frequent partying where they wore paper or soft hats at banquets to signify informality. In England, these hats are an important feature of the family Christmas dinner. In America, paper hats can be found at family birthday celebrations and are important to New Year's celebrations globally. Music and dancing was key to Saturnalia merrymaking, which is yet another feature of Christmas and New Year's celebrations. Christmas is perceived as a religious celebration with the community coming together to spiritually honor the infant deity, the Christ, when in fact, Christmas is simply pagan Saturnalia and Brumelia feasts to honor numerous reigning deities born at Babylon. Even shortly before Christ's return, Yahweh will send two angels, his two witnesses from heaven, to give mankind his final warning, but they will kill them and continue their Christmas traditions. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7 through 10. Begotten by a mortal man, Nimrod, the Christmas spirit is indeed provoked by a spirit, but according to history, archaeology, and scripture, the Christmas spirit is an ancient lying spirit sent to deceive all mankind. Partake not of her sacrificial table, nor should you drink from her intoxicating pagan cup. The Winter Solstice Narrated by Obadiah ben Yisrael 
In a world full of confusion and chaos, the traditions of men, along with superstitions and mythology, legends of old, secret societies and religious idols, along with various celebrated events such as parades and other festivals, there are very serious pagan practices that are conducted during these different holidays. Webster's New World Dictionary defines the winter solstice as the time in the northern hemisphere when the sun is farthest south or away from the equator, roughly around the 21st through the 22nd of December. The word solstice is of Latin origin and actually means standing still sun. The roots, however, of this festival date back thousands of years. There are many cultures the world over that perform solstice ceremonies. And at the root of them all was the ancient fear that the failing light or sun would never return unless humans intervened with anxious vigil or antic celebration. In the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 we are warned, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after the Messiah. The ancient Mesopotamians who dwelt in southern Iraq celebrated a 12-day feast of renewal designed to help their chief god Marduk tame the monsters of chaos for one more year. The name Marduk actually means calf of the sun god. He is also associated with the planet Jupiter. This same pagan worship was incorporated into the Christmas holiday. It is now called the 12 days of Christmas. Some of the rituals of the winter solstice festival included solstice dances. These dances often dramatized what the sun should do. In some South American ceremonies, a dancer would move up a steep flight of stairs, representing the sun in its ascent from north to south. Then they would dance upon a small platform which represented the sun's motionlessness during the solstice. The dancer would then move or be thrown back down the stairs which represented the sun's hope for return across the sky. Solstice dances were also accompanied by other rituals such as offerings to the dead and various other fertility rites and orgies. They also included other fire festivals in which children were sacrificed to their deities and other offerings and prayers to their gods and goddesses. Many ancient cultures built their greatest architectures, tombs, temples, carns, and sacred observatories so that they aligned with the solstices and equinoxes. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 10, starting at verse 1, it states, Hear you the word which Yahweh speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, Learn not the ways of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. The commandments instruct us, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh thy Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Examples of such idols can be seen all throughout Europe and the Americas, Asia, Indonesia, the Middle East, and even Africa. Recent research into the medieval Great Zimbabwe in Sub-Saharan Africa revealed what is known as the African Stonehenge, which was used to calculate the solstices and equinoxes. The celebration of Christmas on December 25th rather than on some other date, was instituted by the Roman Catholic Church 
to replace the heathen winter solstice celebration of the nativity of the sun. Not S-O-N, but S-U-N. The winter solstice was overlaid with Christmas, and the observance of Christmas spread throughout the globe. In the book, The Sun in the Church, it reveals that many medieval Catholic churches, as well as modern day, were also built as solar observatories. The Catholic Church, once again, reinforcing her close ties with both religious celebration and seasonal passages, needed astronomy to predict the date of their holiday, Easter. So observatories were built into cathedrals and churches throughout Europe and the known world. Typically, a small hole in the roof admitted a beam of sunlight which would trace a path along the floor. The path, which was called the meridian line, was often marked by inlays and zodiacal motifs. Things like the sun's position at noon throughout the year, as well as the extremes of the solstices, were carefully marked. These different customs and rituals are in strict contradiction to the laws of the Most High. Yahweh told us to keep all his laws, statutes, and judgments, for this is our wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. Deuteronomy 4 verse 6. We are also instructed in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 15, to study to show thyself approved unto Elohim, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The psalmist Dawid, in chapter 19 of Psalms, summed it up, beginning at verse 7 by stating, The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them is their great reward. In summation, my people, please be not deceived by the customs of men, but on the rather, Take time to research and look beyond the surface to find the true meaning of things. Peace be unto you. Merry Christmas or Merry Mithras, narrated by Yohanna Bat Yisrael. Christmas, whose birthday is it? With all the tradition, with all the legacy, with all of our childhood memories, have we ever really thought ever researched whose birthday it really is. Well, if we did, we would find that Christmas, the highly celebrated day of December 25th, is not and has never been the birthday of the Messiah of the Scriptures. Christ's date of birth was not even in the winter season, but someone else's certainly was. That someone was responsible for one of the first recorded uprisings the first mutinies against Yahweh, the Most High, and those that followed him. His name was Nimrod. Nimrod was described in Genesis 10 and 9 as a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Genesis 11 and 4 told us of he and his followers intended plans for supremacy, quoted as, And they said, Let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Yahweh, the Most High God, did in fact scatter Nimrod and his followers throughout the world, as well as creating many languages to break down their evil communications. Thus, Nimrod's Tower of Babel was not completed. But his attempt at making this great name did not end after his plan was foiled. Both Nimrod and his followers were determined, through reality or myth, to make his name great. 
Nimrod's legend continued as he, at the demise of his father, married his mother, whose name was Ceramus. And at Nimrod's death, Ceramus told all of Nimrod's death and of the myth of his rebirth as a full-grown tree. This day of death and rebirth was December 25th. Nimrod began to be worshipped in this tree form as a god. This tree, its worship, and its adornment was spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 2 through 4. Jeremiah 10 and 2 states, Thus saith Yahweh, Learn not the way of the heathen, for the custom of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, they deck it with silver and with gold. This Nimrod worship grew, and he soon became to be worshipped as a sun god. While Ceramus began to be worshipped as the mother of God, thus began today's Mary worship. Regrettably, this myth did not end in Babylon. As nations intermingled through conquest and contracts, this worship of the sun god continued. His name was often changed to suit the nation, but the customs and traditions associated with this sun god worship was continued largely unchanged. As this form of pagan worship was introduced to the Romans, it was quickly adopted. By this time, the sun god's name had been changed to Mithras. This sun god, Mithras, was thought to be the light of the world, and its religion was referred to as Mithraism, and was considered to be a man's or military religion. The Romans believed that it was Mithras that brought them victory in their conquests and sacrifices to him prior to a battle was mandatory. Mithras' birthday was, of course, also on December 25th. This date was so popular because, as with Nimrod, the date of December 25th has to do with the signs of the zodiac as well as the strength of the sun. December 24th being at that time the shortest day of the year, marking the death of the sun, the following day being the 25th marked the rebirth and the regaining of strength of their sun god and the sun. This astrology included the sun crossing the equator. This point was connected with the zodiac sign of Taurus, the bull. This crossing point, point to point, created the symbol of the cross. This cross symbol had been in use since Babylonian time and was continued with the Romans. The cross symbol covered all of their shields during battle, so truly they held their god Mithras before them for protection in war. Emperor Constantine saw a vision of the sun with the cross beneath it. This cross, or crux, worn by the Crusaders was fashioned identically to that used by Imperial Rome and Babylon before it. The cross is simply the symbol of the sun god. There is no Hebrew word or root translated cross anywhere in the Old Testament scriptures. Each of the 24 times the Greek word saturos is found in the New Testament, English Bibles mistranslate pole or stake as cross. The first one to do this was a Roman Catholic translator whose desire was to merge the Mithras cherished symbol into the church. Mithras worshippers also baptized their newborn children, today is called christening. This action marked the youth's forehead in the symbol of the cross just as is also done today Catholicism in their Ash Wednesday procedures. Mithras weekly holy day was called Sunday. It was held sacred because it was truly the day of the sun, the sun day, their God's day. 
the leader of the rituals was referred to as the father. The highest ranking father was referred to as Papa or Pope. This Pope was marked by his staff and pronounced ring and pointed hat, just as in today's Catholicism. Even their mass included chanting, bells, candles, incense, and holy water, just as today. Mithras and Catholicism, i.e. Christianity, equate. Even all of the seven sacraments of Catholicism are the exact duplicates of those that are acknowledged in Mithras sacraments. The use of halos in Christianity today also directly descends from Mithraism. The halo represents the glow around the head of the sun god and his lesser gods. This is why we see Christian art that promotes pictures of Christ with a halo around his head. He is seen as the sun god unknowingly. Catholicism and Freemasonry all have their roots in Mithraism. Mithraism was worshipped in a secretive fashion. Only men were initiated, and both initiations and services were held in dark underground caves that involved sacrifice. They covered the walls of these caves with secret paintings depicting their god Mithras slaying the bull, that is, that bull being the Taurus in astrology. This is much like the cave-like dwellings that members of the secret society of the skull and bones held meetings at in the elite Yale University, where America's second time President Bush is also a member. Many of the Mithras temples are still existent throughout Europe. Many Christian churches are even built directly on top of these pagan temples. These caves were often referred to as grottos. Notre Dame University popular for its sports, is also popular for its grotto, built to imitate those in Europe. These Christians call it the Cave of Candles, and today come to this cave to pray, just like in Mithraism. The sad reality is that all of these types of actions within Christianity are completely accepted, and each of them, when questioned about, are constantly explained away or just simply ignored. Each of us must make a choice as to whether we will follow the true teachings of the Hebrew scriptures of the Bibles or continue to follow the myths that were made up by man. We must choose to follow Yahweh or choose to follow Nimrod, Mithras, Zeus, Jupiter, or Jesus. Yahweh has but one way, His way. Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go therein. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The Spirit of Christmas the spirit of Christmas is nothing more than a familiar spirit, that is to say, a spirit that is of the world. But how can one be certain that this spirit, the spirit of Christmas, is the spirit of error and not a spirit sent from truth? One can tell by looking at the attributes of this spirit, because the attributes or characteristics will tell you if it's Satan's spirit or if it's a spirit from above. And by this, one can see clearly what fruit or work each spirit bears. According to the world, Christmas is considered to be a holiday of love, a day by which families are unified through their giving, a time where families come together to feast, a time where everyone is happy, peaceful, and considerate of their friends and of their loved ones. But ask yourself a question. Does Lucifer have the authority and or power to give riches and or gifts to his followers. Well, Satan did take the Messiah up into a high mountain and offered unto him all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan said unto him in Luke chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, All this power will I give you, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. 
If you therefore will worship me, all shall be yours. Now if Satan, being evil, knows how to offer and give gifts, marvel not when his children do the same. Just like the Messiah stated, What man will give his son a stone when he asks him for bread? Or what man will give his son a serpent when he asks him for a fish? The questions are, what God empowers a parent and what spirit leads a parent to buy Christmas gifts for their child? Now let's examine the characteristics of this spirit that surrounds Christmas. What type of spirit do people entertain during Christmas time whereby they become afraid to go out and shop? If the Christmas spirit is so righteous, then why must local news stations warn shoppers to be more cautious during this time of the year? What type of spirit causes an individual to lie in wait for ambush at shopping malls for innocent people during Christmas? What God fathered the spirit with the purpose of urging people to fulfill every lust with greed during Christmas time? What spirit is so strong that it can cause parents to tell lies to their children year by year? This spirit is called Christmas. History proves that the spirit of Christmas continues to be a lying spirit. One of their Christmas songs state, He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Who is this he that knows if you are asleep or awake? Who is this he that knows if you have been good or bad? Is this he the most high Elohim? Because only God knows who has been good or bad. And only God knows when man is asleep or awake. However, parents continue to lie to their children and tell their children that Santa Claus has the same ability as God. And for this reason, parents teach their children to worship him as God. This is one way the spirit of Christmas proves that it is a spirit of error, a familiar spirit of the world. The Christmas spirit has convinced parents to lie again and again to their children and tell them that on the night of December 24, Santa Claus will travel the whole world in one night, give gifts to everyone while riding on reindeer that fly. This means that there is not an airline with a jet huge enough or a military with a plane fast enough that can compete with Santa Claus on this night. Oh, what an evil spirit. Even though most people have enough sense to know that reindeer do not fly, this evil spirit persuades a parent to convince their child that reindeer do fly. But marvel not, because even if you do not have a chimney in your home, it is taught that Santa Claus will still get in your home. Truly, the Christmas spirit is a wicked spirit. Most parents, if not all, want their children to always be honest with them. But how can a child learn honesty from a parent who is not honest? Just like the Messiah stated, you are of your father, the devil, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the lust of your father, you will do. Christmas also is a spirit of lust in a time of greed. The general public is anxious to fulfill the desires of their own flesh and the desires of others. People try with all their might to turn their fantasies into a reality and to satisfy their desires more pleasurably. Everyone expects to get what they want, but when someone does not receive what they expected, all love turns into no love. If you do not think so, buy someone a gift that he or she do not want and see if your thought was the only thing that counted. Christmas is a spirit that loves the things of the world and the children of the world are familiar with this spirit. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 states, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Now, 
one can see that the Christmas spirit is a worldly spirit, which is of the devil. This is why crime increases from Thanksgiving through Christmas. The local news stations actually warn people of this evil. This is why the murder and crime rates go up during this time of the year, chiefly because people become more envious of one another, desiring to have what others have, and desiring to do what others do. Peace. Welcome to the Watchman segment of our program. Have you ever wondered why we keep the days that we keep as uh, uh, holidays, but they are basically holy days that the, that the Christian church has set up? Have you ever, ever wondered why these days are not mentioned in the Bible? Of course, we have the uh, word Easter that's uh, mentioned in the Bible, but when you go back and do the research on that, you'll find out that it, it wasn't really Easter as they have it. It was Astaroth, which they changed uh, to Easter. See, what happened was each time uh, the Euro Gentiles conquered another people, what they did was they took their gods and replaced them uh, 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 with gods of their own. Uh, uh, and just like uh, December 25th, which they set aside for Christ's birthday, according to the Bible, Christ was born in the summer months. But what the Roman Catholic Church did was they uh, set his, his birthday on a day that they were already keeping called the winter solstice, which is sun worship. Easter is also another sun sign that people don't pay too much attention to. It comes during the vernal equinox. Of course, they're always a few weeks off, but it still comes through during the vernal equinox. And this is the time that uh, they celebrate uh, 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 what they call Easter. But you might want to go and look into the history of Easter and find out what the eggs represent, what all of this stuff uh, uh, that, it, that that's the rabbits and so forth represent uh as far as Easter is concerned. And then you might want to do some research and find out why uh, people use this, this uh, evergreen tree uh, at de uh, in December 25th to celebrate Christ's birthday. All of these things, if you do the research on them, all of these things are tied steeply up in paganism. And we got these things from our captors and we celebrate these things just because it was given to us as tradition. But just because they're traditions that was given to us uh, by our, our, our captors does not mean that these things are, are supposed to be kept according to the scripture. And then, too, when you look up on the earth today and, and consider that this is supposed to, especially America, how great uh, a Christian country America and Europe is supposed to be, you find out one thing, that these people has fought wars all over the earth. In, in the name of democracy, which is the footstool of Christianity. When the Messiah come, there will be no voting. The Messiah will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever, even forever and ever. Now, sin, which they label crime, is running rampant all over the earth, and we see it. And it's so, it's so rampant and, and so common that we accept these things as uh, as the way that things are supposed to be. But that does not make it right. But what this comes from, this comes from our preachers in these churches not telling, uh, not telling the people what the truth of the word is, but staying off into the New Testament and coming up with all these different denominations and Christian doctrines that they, uh, that they have. And another thing you might want to look at too, According to the Bible, the Messiah was black. Well, why is it that we see uh, a, a Gentile on a cross and they tell us that this was Christ? All of the, most of the pictures we, we see are of a white Jesus. Well, that's just who it is. They're white Jesus. Now, in the 60s, uh, we got smart and we got us uh, a black Jesus and a black Santa Claus. But Jesus is a pagan deity and all of the things that's involved around there, Jesus has to do with uh, uh, heathen, heathenistic paganism. Let me read you something here out of the book of Isaiah. This is Isaiah 24. It says, Behold, Yahweh makes the earth empty and makes it waste and turn it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests, as with the servant, so with his master. 
as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of, of interest, so with the uh, giver of interest to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for Yahweh has spoken this word. The earth mourns and fades away, the world languish and fadeth away, the hearty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore have the cursed curse devoured the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and there are few men left. Few men left to know the truth. That's teaching, teaching the truth, and, and, and basically, man don't want to hear the truth. Man loved uh, uh, to tell our children lies like Santa Claus is going to come from the North Pole and bring you some presents and put them under the tree, and we know doggone well who bought the presents. But yet and still, the church even tells that lie. And then here comes Easter. And when we deal with that, we have we have to deal with the bunnies and the eggs. Now, what has a Santa Claus, bunnies and eggs have to do with the Messiah? All these things are things that man has uh, set in place simply because man does what he wants to do instead of what the Bible uh, uh, says do. And then they'll turn around and say, well, it's for the kids. Well, why would we raise our kids up uh, uh, in that lie? And then they get old enough and say, well, maybe if there ain't no Santa Claus, maybe it ain't no Jesus either. Well, when we do these things, we find that we are talking things that came from other nations of people and things that mostly, mostly we don't do any research about. And with our people, when you tell us what the deal is on this, we don't care because mama did it, father did it, um, grandma did it, grandpa did it. Well, your mother and your father and your grandmother and your grandfather that put up that Christmas tree, that celebrate Easter, that celebrate New Year's, that celebrate Thanksgiving and the holidays that these Gentiles are, are, are set up. All the people that do, do so worship the adversary of the devil. And if you don't believe that, come to the Culture Center and I will show you how that they are worshiping the devil. Everybody talking about they how much they love their Messiah, but and, and, and the word Christian means uh, follower of the Messiah or Christ's life. But when you read the life of the Messiah and the life of the apostles, these people don't do anything that was done in, in, in antiquities. And when you get back and look it up, look up the reason why we keep these things, you'll find out that all of these paganistical things that we're dealing with uh, were started by the Roman Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, Christianity itself was started by Emperor Constantine and Pope St. Leo in 312 AD. Uh, uh, why is it that an emperor had to make Christianity the legal religion of the Holy Roman Empire? And then why did they change uh, the Sabbath day which uh, from Saturday to Sunday, which was the first thing that Yahweh blessed and sanctified? And to show you another thing, too. When you get in the Bible and read the scripture, you find out that all of the all of the names, of, uh, all of the days of the week had numbers. But you might want to get an encyclopedia and look up the names of the days of the week. And these Christian name these days now. Look up the days of the week, and you will find out that these these days were named after their two tonic gods. Even most of the months in the year, they name after their god with fertility rites and so forth and so on. Because it has to do with a bunch of paganism, and uh, these are the things that Yahweh told us not to do. He told us not to learn the ways of the heathen, and all of the things that we do when it come down to holy days and religion. We got these things from strangers. If you are Christian, you got it from the Euro Gentiles. If you are a Muslim, you got it from the Arabs. And if you're Egyptologist, if you practice the religion of Africa, you got it from the Africans. Well, what about us? What about the Hebrews? What do we have 
that that belong to us that we don't deal with it. Well, our culture is written here in the book. It's the first five books of the Bible, uh, 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 and they're fully explained. And and, the, and Yahweh's law covers every aspect of life that you, that 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 you will uh, run into during your lifetime. It tells us what is sin and what is not sin, and when we commit sin, what we should do about these things. And uh, uh, when you when you consider what man is doing, man does just about the total opposite from what the Bible says, yet and still he's going to tell me that he is in love with his God. Of course he is, and his God is Lucifer, and the Bible proves that the whole world is gone after the devil. Why? Because you can do things like you like, you can do commit any sin that you want and go to church and pay your tithes and then you will get a blessing. Ain't that something? And most people, they go to church and pay tithes. They, uh, uh, they pay them because they think that they are going to get a blessing. And I'm old enough to remember when the church didn't tithe because they say they're not under law, they're under grace. And tithe, 10% is written in the Old Testament. 10% is not written in the New Testament any place. These are things that came up by our televangelists, uh, Kenneth Copeland and Orr Roberts and Jimmy Swaggart and those people. And uh, uh, these these are the people who brought Christian, uh, brought the ties and so forth on the scene, just like their fathers, the popes, before they separated on the protesters separated from the Catholics in, uh, in, in 1572, all of the things that were set up for the Christian church were set up by Europeans and no covenant was made with uh, the Europeans. The covenants was made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And if you read uh, uh, Hebrews chapter seven and chapter eight, you'll find out that the covenant that Christ came to seal. He came to seal it with the house of Israel and he sealed it in his blood. This is why our people wrote the whole Bible. This is why our people went out and talked to nations, but the nations destroyed our people and put us in captivity. And uh, 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 then they began to teach their religion. And now the whole world is going mad about it. What do you think the war in Iraq and Afghanistan is about, it's not about 9-11, it's about setting democracy in uh, 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 those uh, Middle Eastern countries that were Muslim. It's about conquering Islam for Christ. And once uh, they conquer Islam for Christ, they'll start doing some of the same things that the people that practice Islam do just to keep those people happy. And this is the way that man has set up his religion all down through uh uh, all the years he's done it according to the way that people feel about uh, different things. This is why even Christianity itself, it's changed over the years and it's still evolving. Why? Simply because these things are not uh, supposed to be done. These things are an abomination to the creator of all things. 